Hello, my name is Danny Nolan I'm the, and I am the Director of Chassis Sim Technologies. And welcome to this latest episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner combined with a chassis sim tutorial. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a real treat for you. We're going to be talking about simulation in action. And in particular, we're going to talk about how it got applied at um, the most um, recent edition of World Time Attack Challenge. OK, to kick off this discussion, when most people will think about simulation, whether you're a general motorsport runner or whether you're a professional data and a race engineer, simulation is often pushed to the sort of the background even when you're starting to seriously engineer the car you'll go through you know looking at data you'll go through what you've done which is all good stuff that you should should do but historically simulation is always pushed to the background and in 2016 a couple of weeks ago at Eastern Creek, I had the opportunity to engineer a customer's car at World Time Attack um, Challenge, in particular the NA Auto Engineering Evo 6. Now, just to show you the power of what simulation can bring to the table, last year these guys were P17. This year they were P3, so we got them on the podium. And really, what I'm going to um, talk about is the story of how we brought Chassis Sim to bear to achieve this result, because really, I mean, there's. I, I realize that in the past that I've recorded a lot of tutorials about how to use Chassis Sim, about how to use its various features. But I think one of the things that's been lacking has been a really big flashing neon light example of what happens when you actually bring all this together um, to achieve a good result. And really, if this is something you're interested in, then listen on. Okay, the car. This car started it off its life as a standard Evo 6, and over time it had engine and aero bits um, added um, to it. Chassis Sim's job was to get the most out of this package, and really, this is really the thing that Chassis Sim brings to the party, in that it will help you light the way in terms of what you should be doing. So, you know, if you have spent thousands on um, your engine bits, if you have spent thousands on your aero bits, Chassis Sim comes in and just finishes that off and allows you to really focus those resources on where they um, should uh, where um, they um, should be um, uh, for, uh, they should be focused on. Okay, first things first. Let's talk about the building blocks of what happened to this really of why this um, uh, result happened. The first building block was a tire model that um, I had developed with um, Andrew Brilliant from AMB Aero over the years. Now. This was developed using the Chassis Sim Tire Force Milling Toolbox, and this particular tire had never seen a test rig. It had just been engineered from race data. Now, there's one misconception that I really want to knock here on the head. There's a really big misconception that when people hear about the Chassis Sim Tire Force Milling Toolbox, they get it into their heads that they need data that is absolutely crystal perfect, like you've had the perfect driver, you've had the perfect lap. Well, I'm here to tell you that while obviously that will short circuit your learning process, in terms of getting going, that's complete rubbish because this particular tire model was taken from race cars that were falling apart at the pieces. Uh, so what was ha uh, what was happening is that there were some cars that were going well, but there were other cars that weren't going so well. And all this sort of came into a funnel and using the tire force modeling toolbox, um, we were able to extract what you see that tire curve to be. So, I re so for those of you who are figuring, oh, you know what? I don't think my data is good enough. I don't think I'm good enough. Well, well, you know what? I've got a very, very simple um, thing to tell you. Swing the bat and get going. The second building block was that I spec'd out the dampers for this particular car. Now, when we talk about specking out dampers, we're all convinced that in order to specify a damper, you need to have an IQ somewhere in the order of 300, and you need to be able to solve 15 forward of differential equations on the back of a beer coaster. Well, I can tell you right now, the approach that we did in terms of specking out these dampers, there was nothing fancy. I used the damper guide that um, I've um, written a number of race car engineering articles about, and I've also documented it in a couple of the chassis sim tutorials and Dan Vi Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner. And all we did was just focused on a very, very simple approach to 
identify what the difference were between the body velocities and where the damping velocities were. We used that as our bypass and we effectively used that figure that you see there in terms of divvying up between a low speed and a high speed region to um, specify the dampers. Now what that meant was that the platform we were dealing with was really well controlled and that's absolutely critical because as you can see going uh, uh, as you can see going back to the picture of this Evo that car is going to be ride height sensitive. I can tell you right now, that thing is generating more downforce than a GT3 or a GT2 car. So consequently, that ability to have that platform really well controlled really set us up so that we weren't chasing our uh, so that we weren't chasing our own tail. Now, in terms of race engineering um, the car, the big issue that we were dealing with was mid corner understeer, and this is really where. And one of the great things I really enjoyed about um, uh, this um, race weekend is this was a race weekend where a lot of the tra uh, where a lot of training came together, uh, uh, came together really in a day a uh, day or two. And when the owner Nick Ashwin was coming in telling me, okay, the car's doing this, the car was doing that, because of all the vehicle dynamic study that I've done over the decades, I was able to go right. This is where we need to focus on. We need to play with bars, springs, and ride heights. The bars and the springs were to deal with um, the mid to turn exit um, understeer. The ride heights was to really get a, a get a handle of, of controlling our aero platform. And we also didn't do anything particularly crazy here. We just focused on small, sensible changes that we ran through with chassis sim. We looked at the data to make sure that we weren't doing anything silly. However. We did that from the test day to the first day of running and the car was doing okay. We were doing about 1 minute 32s but we were still dealing with a lot of mid corner understeer and turn exit understeer. The coup de grace here was using chassis sim. Now while progress had been made there was still a bit of understeer that had to be dialed out and Nick sort of said to me flippantly look mate we've got a set of die flanks here that we can use. And, and it's really interesting actually because chassis sim has primarily been used in spec formula or formulas where it's really really tightly regulated I was sort of approaching and because that's obviously where I've spent a lot of my time doing data and race engineering like in free grand V8 supercars a1 GP you do tend to be a little bit conservative then on the Friday night it hit me you know what this is an open technical formula. I can do whatever the hell I feel like. So just for grins, I'd called a front spring change and I just figured, well, let's throw in the dive plans. Let's see what they were going to do. Well, when I did that, as you can see, here's the screen grab. The colored is the baseline. The, sim, uh, um, the, colored, uh, the colored is the baseline. The black is with the dive planes and the, and, uh, the black is with the um, uh, dive planes um, uh, put in and that spring change. Now, my first thought when I saw that was, this is just way too good to be true. But here's the giveaway. Take a look at how consistent that C time plot is. Also too, have a look at um, how subtle the changes are, anywhere, uh, are here. It's not doing anything particularly big. It's doing small sensible changes. If you ever wanted a post, uh, if you ever wanted a poster child of what a good simulator change looked like that was it so going into the circuit on um, Saturday morning uh, I gave Nick and the boys a call I called it we made the change and that was the critical tweak that set up the podium because had we not done that uh, we probably would have gone from about P17 to knocking around the top 10 and look not a bad result but that was the tweak that really got us over the line and got us um, uh, to um, P3. And with and I can tell you right now, and this is not meant to sound self-serving, without chassis sim, we would have been at sea on this change. And that really shows you what happens when you bring a tool like chassis sim to the fore. So you're crazy leaving home without it. Also, too, I want to make a point that this was done without perfect correlation. When this model came together, and in particular, me generating the setup service um, uh, came together, it, this was far from perfect. There have been there was a quite there were quite a few things on my plate, but what we've got here is a comparison between actual and simulated. Actual is coloured, simulated is black, 
now as you can see the throttle traces aren't perfect the speeds uh, the um, the the speed traces aren't perfect however that was good enough to get us in the ballpark to get the result we needed and I really can't stress that enough now if this had been say a very very tightly controlled formula say such as GP2 GP3 clearly I would have gone to a lot more trouble to make sure that everything was perfect because with those formulas you're looking for very small changes however for a formula like this what this really illustrates is that while perfect correlation is great and I've always said that correlation is a consequence not the main goal this was good enough to do what we needed to do so I really want you to bear that in mind also to a little side note here I wanted to put put in this slide of the myth of tight technical regulations now it really saddens me that most motorsport regulatory bodies and there's all and there's this absolute undercurrent of motorsport um, uh, of the motorsport general po populace that technology has destroyed the show and if I had five dollars for every time I've seen that with motorsport technical authorities whether I'd seen it whispered in the paddock I can tell you right now I would not be giving this tutorial today I would have retired as a multi multi millionaire in a subtropical paradise surrounded by lovely ladies who would want to have their wicked way with me every day but I'm here so the other myth is it's driven up the cost of motorsport all right let's take a look at um, the big ticket items budgets for this weekend that laid the platform for Nick Ashwin and the boys from NA Auto Engineering to go from P17 to P3 AMB Aero package that was about five grand chassis sim setup service 1500 front dive plane and that's 500 bucks and most of that was just machining the carbon uh, were, most of that was um, machining the carbon fiber if you really wanted um, to get anal about this uh, um, yeah we might throw in ten dollars there for the pop rivets we used to put the dive planes onto um, the front spoiler so to you techno skeptics out there and to anyone from a technical um, from motorsport regulatory body listening to this I've got a simple observation for you these mods enabled an amateur driver albeit a pretty good one to keep a pro driver very honest and that pro driver would eventually take p1 in the open class so I've got a very simple question for you how does this spoil the show so let me wrap this up the use of chassis sim was absolutely critical for NA auto engineering to get on the podium for world time attack the foundation was laid in the time modeling and the damper specifications and we used simple deliberate steps in race engineering we did not do anything silly however the coup de gras was using chassis sim to call that front dive plane change and I can tell you right now and this is not meant to be self-serving but bottom line this is a classic case uh, um, uh, this is a classic case of why you are crazy if you are not using a tool like chassis sim because ladies and gentlemen that trophy right there is the proof of the pudding all right so this concludes this episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner and the chassis sim tutorial and we'll catch you in the next episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner but you know what don't take my word for it if you're not a member of the chassis sim community check out our online simulation work through the process and you too can be achieving results like this provided you use the tool properly